I, I do want to say this morning that my favorite introduction, there are many ways to introduce me, and the list is very long because I am now very old. Um, I, I have lived a very privileged life. There's no question in my mind about that. The things that God has allowed us to do, the situations he's put us into, the problems he's asked us to solve. Uh, I, I can't say enough. My wife uh, agrees with me as well. When we look back over the years and the places that we've been privileged to minister, it, uh, you know, it is just remarkable. But my favorite introduction, and I often say this to people, uh, somebody has the job of introducing me when I arrive in Ecuador or in Brazil or somewhere else. And and they always, you know, they've got all kinds of questions because they they don't have Joseph Tanchi, who knows me very well and has full access to my CV and all of that. Um, and so they come to me and they say, uh, where did you go to school and where did you study and where did you learn and where have you ministered? And, and I say, you know, let's that would take too long. Let's just sum up. I am nothing more or less than a servant of the Lord. That's all I do. He's chosen the places that I've worked and the things that I've done over the years. And uh, if, if you can be helped by, by learning of my mistakes as I've gone and the things that I've done to adjust, then, then perhaps we can save you making the same mistakes that I made. And then you can make your own mistakes all on your own and you can sort out a better way to do that so that you can pass it along to others as well, especially those who are new in ministry. Now, we have this chart up here on the board and we kind of filled it all in right before we went to lunch. And I understand completely why you would not want to take time asking questions when it was lunchtime, right? I mean, I guess you start me talking and I might have talked all the way through lunch and then you would have missed that and we can't have that. So I'm, I just wanted to know uh, before we begin, are there any questions that you have about this chart and how this chart works? Uh, because we're going to talk about this chart as we go this morning. All right, let me just remind you that these outer parts out here, behavior and values, are the most surfaced parts of the culture. They are the things you can most quickly discern, the things you can most quickly understand. These things in here, the belief system right here is something that, that you'll want to focus on, but you won't be able to get there until you watch their behavior and understand their values because beliefs create values. Values create behavior. Our behavioral choices are made based on our values. In the inside here is the most, uh, is the deepest part of the culture. And this is where the deepest motivations for the culture come from. This is where the deepest motivations for the human heart. When you woke up this morning and decided to start your day in a particular way, you started your day that way, not because you thought it was a good way to behave, but because something within you was driving that. I'm not gonna ask you if you took a shower, that's really none of my business. But if you did take a shower, you didn't take a shower, you didn't walk into the shower thinking, I really don't know what this is going to accomplish, but I'll just go ahead and take a shower. Anyway, there were things that were going on that were much deeper. And those were the things that helped to drive that. Simple decisions, deep decisions, the way you relate to your children, the way you relate to your spouse, are all driven by these things here at the center. Now we were talking about walking in the garden. Do you remember that? We were talking about coming to the garden and suddenly being silent. We're walking through the forest, but now we've come to the garden, the edge of the garden, and the man that I was walking with turned around and said, be quiet. We walked through the garden in silence. We got to the other side and now we're all and so we knew, I understood the behavior immediately. What is the behavior? When you enter the garden, be quiet. It's as simple as that. But why? If you want to, if you want to understand why, then you're going to, he very naturally quieted down as soon as we entered the garden. He's a believer. He's a follower of Jesus. But there were deep-seated worldview issues still left in his heart. 
that had him being quiet in the garden. He was quiet in the garden because he values what? What is it that he values? He values the crop. He values the harvest. He values being able to feed his family. And being quiet in the garden speaks to all of those values. But why? Why are we really quiet in the garden? You heard me say it yesterday. Can you remember the name of the, 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 the middle level spirit that oversees the garden there among those people? Eoma, yes. Yes, Eoma, uh, E meaning from the, and Oma meaning garden, from the garden. The, the middle level spirit that's from the garden oversees the garden, and the middle level spirit that's from the garden in traditional Bukalot culture is the one who determines whether or not you will have a good harvest. And so you want to appease Eoma, and if Eoma expects you to be quiet as you're walking into the garden, well, then you should be quiet as you're walking into the garden. That belief drives the value of the crop and wanting to harvest it, and that's what makes you be quiet. So we have to go in then a little deeper. When we get in as, as, uh, as, 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 as tight as the world view right here, Aoma is watching, and she will punish if you are inappropriate. That's the worldview. Remember, the worldview is that thing that says, when I open my fingers here, this thing is going to fall to the ground. You, you don't believe that it's going to fall to the ground. Were we clear on that? I didn't mean to be unkind to anybody. We don't sit there and believe. We don't pray that it will hit the ground. We don't believe that it's going to hit the ground. We expect that it's going to hit the ground. And if it doesn't hit the ground, but we, our belief system is not rock. It's our worldview. What is going no, that should have hit the ground. Jay is doing something foolish up there. He's doing something tricky up there. So knowing, believing that, that Aoma is there comes from this worldview, that she's watching over the garden and will punish. People believe their worldviews. Remember, worldview is not something we think about. Worldview is something that we think. And at the inside of that is the story. And the story, uh, well, maybe you can picture a tribal setting where we're sitting in a Baha'i Kubo, you know, a, a thatched roof house with, with bamboo woven walls, and mom is sitting there, and she has her three-year-old or her four-year-old, and she's going to go up to the garden, and as she's on her way up to the garden, the child is... What's she going to do as she gets to the edge of the garden? She's going to tell him a story about what's in the garden. Not someone that we need to be afraid of, but someone that we need to respect. And I have seen this happen right within your own culture. Forgive me for this. I remember when, when, uh, I was, uh, when we were living up at Aritao and flying in and out to, uh, from Aritao into the tribal station where we were working, and we would get on a bus, or I would get on a bus, and now I'm going to Manila. And I'm standing there in the aisle, and there's a little child there that's just crying, just all upset. And I watched it happen. The mother would whisper something into the child's ear. And then the child would go and look at me. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if it's the white spirit, but I'm pretty sure what she said was, look at how fat that American is. If you don't stop crying, he will eat you. I will give him to you to him, and he will eat you. And now suddenly the child has stopped behaving inappropriately because of something that is at the very core. He's been told a story that isn't true, but the story has had the impact. He's believed the story on the worldview level. It's established for him. And is there any danger to talking to your child like that? Well, it's a lie in the first place. And I always wanted to say that I'm not going to eat you. But I didn't think that would help. It's a lie in the first place. But what are the chances that when your child grows up, after living with that fear as a child, 
what are the chances that they can get into a relationship with an American and actually feel like an equal, to work on equal terms? There's danger to what we tell by way of stories to our children. And the same thing is true within a tribal group. Stories, what happened to them, and what we tell themselves about it is what makes all the difference in their lives. Hold on a second. No, I'm not getting a surprise. I'm just getting my mouse. <laughs> I was actually going to get my fork and spoon so that I could eat you if you're not quiet during the meeting. No, I, I, I try not to do that. So we're talking about how what happened to me, which is my story, impacts my worldview. My worldview impacts my beliefs, drives my beliefs, my beliefs drive my values, my values drive my behavior. Are there any questions about that before we move on? Yes. You can take off your mask just while you ask the question. I'm not afraid of you. The stories are very powerful. Yes. Yes. Talking about spirit. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's generated by the stories. It comes from the stories. Can you hear him back there? Not you can't. They can't hear you at all. Do we have a ah? Uh, Another microphone, is it somewhere? Voila. Okay. Uh, thank you, sir, for putting content and substance to your presentation. It's very clear. But I guess the question I have is about discipleship because the stories are actually very powerful because the people, especially the tribal people that you are, who you were working before were experiencing, you know, the power of the spirits. And the question I have is about discipleship because when we bring the story of God, well, that is the message that is the gospel. Uh, that's God's worldview. But on the other hand, how can you make, you know, faith, being experienced and talking about powers you know because when we share the gospel it's just about telling the story but then people are waiting for powers to happen you know at the worldview level i think can you contribute about you know can you say something about exorcism and all the stuff you know Uh, uh, yes, that's an excellent question, and um, wow, there's so much that I could or, or perhaps should say about it, but, but let me just say this, that uh, it, it is not the power of the spirits that captivates them. It is the story about the power of the spirits that captivates them. Uh, they hear those stories from the time they're very, very young. And when it comes time for you to change the culture, when it comes time for you to speak into the culture and change what they actually believe, because that's where we're going. We're going to talk about uh, differences that we make on the, on the belief level. But in order to, when we make differences on the belief level, but it doesn't, we don't touch the worldview, then worldview and belief now are in conflict. And you heard me say it yesterday, when worldview and belief are in conflict over a long period of time, worldview wins out every time. And so the question that you're asking um, is the very thing that we're going to try to answer this morning, or at least set the stage for answering this morning. Change within the culture doesn't come from outside. It doesn't come through 
through the behavior. It doesn't come through the values. It doesn't come through the belief system. You can change their belief system and still not change the way they look at the world. The only way to change the way they look at the world is to come from the inside. And what's on the inside of a human being? What's on the inside of a culture? Well, yeah, when you all talk at once like that, I can't understand what you're saying. What is on the inside? What is the prime driver in every culture? The story. The story. It all comes from the story. Now, when you say the story that we tell them, most of us mean we're going to go in without doing any kind of homework at all without trying to understand where these people are coming from. And we're going to tell them that Jesus loves you. He has died for you. We have a tendency to just jump to the gospel and teach the gospel repeatedly, going after their belief system without actually providing a story context for what you're about to say. Now, in most animistic cultures, the spirits are an absolute nuisance. The spirits can ruin your crop. The spirits can kill you. They can kill your children. And you have to spend all of your time worrying about those middle-level spirits. Eoma and, and Agimung and Palatsiak and then some of the other ones that I told you about yesterday. You spend all of your time worrying about those, those. And so if we walk in, and forgive me for this, but if we walk into that context and say, God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life, what will the reaction be? Well, if God loves me and has a wonderful plan for my life, I won't worry about him. I'm not going to worry about him at all. I, I have to keep worrying about these spirits that are such a nuisance. And so they will continue to interact with the middle level spirits because you haven't used a story to change the way they look at the world, which will change what they believe, which will change their values, which will change their behavior. Do you understand what I mean by that? We're going to talk about using a storying approach right from the very beginning and correcting their wrong notions about God before you get to the story of Jesus. You correct their wrong notions about God. You help them to understand who God really is. You invade their story. Provide them with a new story. You allow Jesus to invade their story. You set the stage for Jesus coming. And you get them to the place where they are without hope. They are helpless. Manipulating the, the middle-level spirits isn't going to help. I am lost and I am on my way to hell. And that's when you get to say, once they fully understand that, that's when you get to say that the angel Gabriel appeared to a woman named Mary and God announced via Gabriel that he was about to keep all of the promises that he had made about sending the Redeemer, about sending the one who way back in the garden was promised it was promised that the Redeemer, when he comes, the serpent will bruise his heel, but he will crush the serpent's head. And as you tell that story at the beginning, they begin to understand that God is a God of holiness. He is a God of justice. He will throw Adam and Eve out of the garden. He hates sin. He punishes sinful people. And the story becomes heavier and heavier and heavier. And you don't ask them to believe the story as you go. You just ask them to understand it. And in my experience over the years, when you first tell the story of Noah, they, well, the story of Noah is different. Almost every animist, almost every tribal group has a story about Noah. Did you know that? I've been in at least 100 tribal groups. They, know, they don't call him Noah, but there's a story of a flood. I mean, it's back there in our memory. With the exception of the Bukalot, who have no history. They're generational amnes amnesiacs. They... They, uh, they don't mention the name of the dead, and so they can never share history. The person is dead. It doesn't matter what happened during his lifetime. They can't, they can't share history. But as you, as you tell one story upon after another, and you build truth in their thinking, 
They begin to respect God. They begin to understand that he's holy. They begin to understand that he's just. He hates sin. He punishes sinful people. And story after story after story brings that true. And you're telling stories about someone else. Here in Asia, it's very important that we save face. Yes? So if every time you come to hear me teach, I say, you are a rotten, creepy sinner. What are you going to? Well, sooner or later, you're just going to stop listening. You can't do that. But those people in that day, they disobeyed God. So what do you think God is going to do? Well, God will punish them. And you build story upon story upon story. And they are coming to understand the true God of the universe. He has invaded their story. And then the moment is going to finally come as Jesus arrives. And, and now they, they can begin to build their hope on him. And, and many of them have not heard this story at all. He, he heals people and he, he takes care of people and he moves from one place to the other. He teaches God's word. He is God in the flesh. When the Redeemer finally comes, it is God himself. God himself who takes on human form. Who expected that? No one. God himself has arrived. And now he's going to deal with this issue. And as he deals with this issue, this issue of sin and separation from God, He's going to heal and, and work miracles, and, and everybody's going to start saying, oh, my goodness, if only Jesus was here, he would heal my mom. My, you know, and, and then finally, the tide of public opinion turns against him. The Sanhedrin gets involved, and Rome gets involved. They crucify him and lay him in the tomb. And my hope is gone. I thought that Jesus would be the one. I thought that God in human form would deal with this problem. And then on the third day, oh my, buckle your seatbelts. He bursts out of the tomb and speaks to his followers and says, go tell everyone. Go make disciples among everyone. Baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son. Make disciples, baptize them, and teach them to do what I've taught you to do. And lo, I am with you always to the very end of the age. What we're going to recommend here is that instead of going after their behavior, that would have been easy with the Bukalot. They were headhunters. All the men had taken a head. They, you, you couldn't get married if you hadn't taken a head. I hope to get to the place where I'm able to tell that story at the end. We could have preached a gospel that said, stop headhunting. <coughs> Stop taking heads. We could have said that. But that wasn't the message that we proclaimed to them. We taught them the truth about God because they had lost the concept of God. Read Romans chapter 1. They've lost the concept of God. They don't like to retain God in their thinking. Uh, they, you know, they, they stopped glorifying God as God. Their foolish hearts were darkened. And so God gave them over to what they chose to believe. And the only way to bring them back is to go to wherever they are and tell them the true story about God. If you change their story, you will change their worldview. If you change their worldview, you will change what they believe. If you change what they believe, you will change their values. If you change their values, you'll change their behavior. You won't have to stop, tell them to stop headhunting. You won't have to tell them to stop headhunting. They will stop headhunting. I saw this happen over and over and over again with the Bukalo. They would come to me and say, doesn't God's word say this? Yes, it does. And don't we do this? Yes, you do. <laughs> well, shouldn't we then stop doing this? Well, what do you think? I think we should stop doing this. Well, why don't you take that truth and share it with your brothers and sisters who are also Bukalot? Because coming from you, it would be so much more powerful than coming from me. That's discipleship. That's discipleship. So rather than wishing, I've been in situations where we, especially in animistic cultures, I've been in situations where we've been forced to stare down, to deal with a person who is demon-possessed. 
I'm not going to go Twilight Zone on you, and I'm not going to go Exorcist on you. Hollywood has it all wrong, you know. I've never seen anybody, uh, but I, it's clearly a question of demon possession. And there are ways to deal with that, but they're not going to look like these powerful things. And because you have power over this evil spirit, that doesn't necessarily mean that their hearts and minds are going to be pointed towards God and God's power, God's ability in that. It may put you in a class that, well, you don't want to be. I know that's a lot all at once, and really we're, I was planning to just go through that step by step, but I want to warn you where we're going. I want to recommend to you that we use a storying approach right from the very beginning, that you take time, and I'm going to recommend that you not only take time to learn their language, if you've taken the time to learn their language, God bless you. That is, that is so powerful. It's such hard work. I know, I've done it twice. But if you take time to learn their language and you forget that worldview drives language, and you don't take time to learn their worldview, then they will later say, thank you for what you did, but I wish you had done your homework, as my friend Eli Chikuna. I wish he were here to talk to you. Of course, he only speaks Portuguese, and we'd have to translate through several different languages to get to, <laughs> to, get to us. But um, I, I, I hope I haven't unnerved you, and we really are going to take some more time with this. Are, are there any other questions or comments? Y yes, can you? Be because my answer won't make sense if we don't understand your question. I think it's I think it's on. It may need to be turned up. Hello. There. Hi. <laughs> Hello. Okay. Uh, yesterday we were talking about uh, struggle people who have already been like uh, they appear as somebody who are civilized and with uh, young professionals. Yep. Um, yes. But deep within. Their worldview hasn't changed. That's yet. correct, yes. Okay, so my question is what could be a concrete example in approaching a person who said they knew Christ but, but was still holding on with his worldview of the spirits? How can we. With just his an example of the spirits? Yeah, a concrete example of how we can approach them. All right. Because uh, uh, they seem to appear like they knew Christ. And they are professionals. But they, they are, are hiding their antig antig and they are yes, uh, yes. they're going to the abladio mm. and, yeah, and yes, yes. they're still dealing with the spirit world. Uh, when and they a, get sick, they go to the Mansipok. Uh, uh, it's a yes. it's a priest in in Karkanai context. <laughs> yes, it's it would be the, the shaman, the, the, the spiritual yeah. practitioners mm -hmm. because they believe that the, the middle yes. level spirits yes. are the ones that are responsible. Mm -hmm. So, right. as a missionary, how can we approach them? All right. Just a concrete example. That, that is a very, all right, I'll try to, I will try to give a, a very concrete example. Um, uh, let's imagine that we're dealing with a people just like that, who are, um, who are still believing that the, the middle-level spirits are the ones that oversee wellness and can, you know, can make you well. Probably as part of the story that they've been told, is that the only way that you can become well is if you appease those middle level spirits, right? Now the question is, how do we undo that? That's, that would be concrete. How do we undo that as we're, they claim to be believers, but this is still left over in their culture. It's probably still left over. I'm, I'm just gonna say this, uh, you know, I, I don't mean to be unkind. It's probably still left over in their culture because it wasn't addressed prior to the gospel. Uh, we're going to look at barriers, bridges, and blanks this morning if we, if we get into these notes at all. Um, we're going to look at barriers, bridges, and blanks as, as part of the worldview. That, that idea that you can't get well unless you deal with the middle-level spirit, spirits will be a barrier to people believing. 
because they hear your claims of Christ and the shaman says to them, oh, you should not believe in Jesus because if you believe in Jesus, those Christians, they will tell you to stop going to the abulario, to the, to the shaman, to the practitioner. And if you stop going to the shaman, then you're going to get sick and die and your kids are going to get sick and die because there will be no solution for your illness. But what if in the run-up to the gospel, as you're preparing them to hear the gospel, that's the vehicle that the gospel rides in, what if as you're preparing them to hear the gospel, you tell them stories about the life of Jesus? What was one of the things that characterized Jesus' life and ministry? Healing, the power to heal, the power to heal. And so as you're teaching, you emphasize, because you know this is going to be a barrier to their believing at some point, you emphasize the, pat, the fact that Jesus is able to heal. And part of the way that he healed people was by casting middle-level evil spirits out of them. You remember the day that the man walked into the synagogue? <laughs> Jesus was up front teaching. And the demon-possessed man walked into the, into the synagogue. In the Bukala translation, it says that he, Kimalangit, <laughs> excuse me, he went, ah! <laughs> That's never happened to me when I've been up front teaching. But Jesus, he's up front teaching. This man walks in and he screams. And you remember what he says? I know who you are the blessed one of God. Have you come to send me to my punishment before the time? Do you know what that tells us? That tells us that the middle level spirits, the evil spirits are afraid of Jesus. They're afraid of his power. They're afraid of his authority. He has the ability to heal. He has the ability to deal with these middle level spirits. And as I come to the point where you're going to share the gospel with me, he died for me, he was buried, and he rose again, if my heart is already prepared to not worry about these barriers, if you've taken the time to teach me those truths, then when you get to the place where you're going to talk to me about death, burial, and resurrection, I'm going to be much more inclined to hear what you have to say without worrying about the threat that the shaman will give me, that this evil spirits will not respond to this Jesus that they're asking you to believe in. Do you, do you see what I'm saying? We have stories of power at our disposal. And even if I don't wander around exercising my power, I have had opportunities where that responsibilities where that was the only possibility. But even if I don't go around exorcising people, we know that we have the gospel. But they need to be ready to hear the gospel. Like that guy with, you need to believe the gospel. Remember the, the big G on his sweatshirt? He wasn't ready to hear the gospel. Why? Because his notion of God protected him from the truth of the gospel. His notion of God was that God was just going to pat him on his head and say, oh, you tried. So why? He doesn't need a savior. He doesn't need a savior. And that had to be dealt with before he had the opportunity to believe. The gospel came to him before the truth about God came to him. Many settings around the world, Jesus is on the television. And so we don't have the opportunity to front load it. But if you're down there in the, in the barrio, if you're down there working in another culture, if you're working with the Kankanae, gospel's been up there for a long time, both with Kankanae and Ibaloi, the Iguro tribes up there. Uh, gospel's been up there for a long time. And so everybody already has an idea about Jesus. I think the safest thing to do is go back to the Old Testament. That's how I started with the Bukalo. I taught story by story through the Old Testament twice before we ever opened the New Testament together. And then at the end of that time, we played a game. I won't try to play it here, but we played a game. I said, all right, here's the deal. We're going to start telling the story of redemption. And we're going to start with the fall of Lucifer, where sin came into the universe. 
We're going to start with the fall of Lucifer, and you're going to start telling the story, all right? Start with the fall of Lucifer. And if he makes a mistake, or he leaves something out, or he forgets something, or he says something that's wrong, raise your hand. And if you raise your hand and you're right, I'm sorry, you know, you missed that, then you pick up the story where he left off. And now you tell, and now you're telling the story and you've worked us through creation in the beginning God created. You've given us the six days and the seventh day of creation. Um, by the way, it's seven days, not six. I, I know that what a lot of us are, forgive me for this, it's, I know that a lot of us are Chinese um, and, and you're just like Americans when it comes to the work is, is different from the rest. But the seventh day was important, was just as important as the, in fact, it was more important than the other days because God propped his feet up. He sat with Adam and they sat there and they looked at creation. God had made it all. Adam had given names to all of it. And the very first thing that they did together was to sit down and just enjoy it for a whole day. Just because it wasn't a day of work doesn't mean it wasn't part of creation. It's something that we miss. But, but as you're making your way through and, and you're teaching about creation, they begin to form ideas about God that you reinforce over and over and over again. And that's what I would do with the Kankanae. I would go back through there. And now, as they're telling the story, now, well, now our brother there has made a mistake and he, he's, uh, he's forgotten something. And so now one of our sisters is going to start up. And, and it took three and a half hours. Because the deal was, whoever is talking when it's time to say, the angel Gabriel appeared to Mary and said, whoever's talking at that point wins the whole game. And so they, oh, they were trying to take it away from each other. I, no, no, he, he was wrong. And now I'm going to start talking and now I've made a mistake, but I'm going to listen to the next guy. And, and it actually happened. But the, the part for me that was so wonderful is that they sat there in their seats and they kept nudging each other. I could see it. I could hear it. And the thing that they kept saying to each other was, oh, we really do know this story. We know this stuff. We understand it. And when they were all done, I took the opportunity to say, you know, in the United States of America, there's a place called Dallas Theological Seminary. Oh, very, very important place. And I know, I know for a fact that if I were to sit all of their graduates down and ask them to do what you just did, they would not be able to do it. They would not be able to tell the story that led up to the moment when the angel Gabriel appeared and announced that God himself was going to be with us. He was going to become human, the son of a virgin, 100% human, 100% God. But they were ready to hear that. So that's what I would do. I'd go back and get those stories of power. And I would emphasize the power that God has. And then I'd talk about Jesus and his life. And I'd talk about the, I'd, I'd tell stories about him healing sickness, where you have to be careful is that they not get the idea that Jesus will heal all of their sicknesses. That's not in the gospel. Is Jesus able to? Yes. Will he? Well, we'll pray about it and we'll ask him to do that. But in the end, he is sovereign. He is in charge. And we'll let him decide. Does that help at all? Okay. I mean, what are you going to say? You, you, unless you come running back up here and say, no, that was stupid. Um, <laughs> That, thank you. Thank you for that. Okay, should, we, should we move on? Because I keep telling you about things that we're going to do, but we're not going to do, uh, we won't unless we start. We won't finish unless we start. Isn't that profound? Huh? <laughs> See, that's why they asked me to come here, not because I know stuff like that, that we won't finish unless we start. There are three points that we need to make about this chart this a little closer so I can stand a little further back. There are three points that we need to, be, to make about this chart. Everything on the outer circle is tied to and gives hints about things at the core. 
The fact that we're quiet in the garden tells me that there's something at the core that's driving that. Everything on the outer circle is tied to and gives hints about things at the core. Both good and bad behavior is tied to the core. It comes from the core, not from random decisions that they make when it's time to behave in a particular way. Parts of their culture must be preserved by their choice and other parts will be discarded by their choice. So rather than attacking what they believe, if you attack what they, what, the way they behave, if that's what you go after, stop drinking, stop smoking, stop hanging around with the girls that drink and smoke, stop, 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 stop. If you do that, they likely will stop doing that, at least when you're around. But that doesn't mean that their hearts have been changed, and that doesn't mean that they've believed the gospel, just because they do things differently. Secondly, whoop. Secondly, you cannot permanently change things in the outer circles without changing things at the core first. Don't go after the things in the outer circles. Don't, don't even bother. Just continue to work. Jesus talked much less about our behavior and much more about our hearts. That was an important component to Jesus. It was the heart that mattered. Why? Because he knows if he, he knew, he knows, he knows today. If he can change my heart, that will change the way I behave. Did you hear me? If he can change my heart, that will change the way I behave. You won't have to tell them to stop. When the, when the core changes, other things quite naturally change. Think of this as the epicenter of the earthquake. <laughs> when, whenever the epicenter begins to move, whenever that, those plates shift and move against one another, people miles and miles and miles away feel the earthquake. They feel the tremor. There is a center where it all happened, but it emanates out from the center. The same thing is true. Changes that happen at the core will find their way out to the surface. And this one then, third one, you cannot change things at the core without permanently changing things in the outer circles as a result. And this is why it is so important to be careful with your teaching. You remember the title for this time that we have together? Take heed how you build. Those are the words of the Apostle Paul. Whatever change you make in here will find its way out into the behavior. And so make sure when you teach that you are teaching the truth and not some American idea of the truth. You don't want them to grow up spiritually and become Americans. You don't want them to become Americans, believe me. But neither do you want them to become Tagalogs or Chinese. You want them to become followers of Jesus that come from their culture. I wanted to have Bukalot followers of Jesus. That's what I was after. Not Bukalot followers of American ways or Bukalot followers of Tagalog ways or Filipino ways. I wanted them to be Bukalot followers of Jesus. And if you attend a worship session, we sometimes get, to, we get together every year at conference, three or 4,000 will be together. And now we're singing a worship song together and there will be people in the audience, especially older people, who will, who will put their arms up like this and bend their knees and do the bukalote dance during worship. They're standing there and they're saying, I am bukalote, but I belong to Jesus. I follow Jesus. And that's some of the most powerful expressions that you can have. When the core changes, um, my wife is a nurse, by the way, and, and uh, she works in the outpatient department at the hospital where people come in because they need, they need uh, intravenous IV antibiotics. Now, maybe you can imagine that, that if, if she's not careful with the way she approaches it, as she puts this, if, if there are bacteria, if there are any germs, if there are, then the fact that she's inserting that into the, vein, into the artery 
will mean that those people will suffer because as that blood makes its way, that, that bacteria is that she is very careful because she knows that what she does with an IV is very quickly going to get to the core and she can kill a person instantly. I'm asking you to show the same care with your teaching. Because if you're teaching to the core and you're wrong, oh my goodness. So not only do you need to understand the culture, the worldview, you need to understand God's word as well. And not be teaching your own cultural biases to them. Teach them the truth from God's word. And, let, and then let the spirit of God apply the word of God to their hearts so that they can change all the way out to the edges. Issues with that, problems with that? Maybe I shouldn't uh, stop just yet. Maybe I should just keep going. Now, it may seem strange to you to have the story at the core. Uh, if you've taken an anthropology course, I won't ask how many of you have, but if you've taken an anthropology course, you won't find the story at the core. Uh, in anthropological literature, the very center is worldview. Because, because most anthropologists believe that worldview is a very static thing. It's not in flux, it doesn't flow, it doesn't change. And what that says to us, what that says to me is, whatever it was that my parents taught me, I, I will never change during the course of my life because there's nothing powerful enough to change worldview. I've watched it happen. The story changes us, and so it's there. My story is defined simply as what happened to me. Oh. My story is defined simply as what happened to me and what I tell myself about it. What happened to me and what I tell myself about it. This thing happened to me when I was nine years old. I told myself something about this event that happened in my life. And, not, and, and 60 years later, I am still telling myself the same thing. It is our story that inevitably shapes and changes us. It's the story that changes us. Not my efforts at at behaving differently. Uh, we, for years, Faith and I had a gym membership. I, I know I don't look like it right now, but we had a gym membership. And I went there faithfully. Now I'm doing other things for exercise. But we had a gym membership. I went there faithfully, and I went there every day, except for January 1st, 2nd, 3rd, and 4th. Do you know why I stopped going on January 1st, 2nd, 3rd, and 4th? because people had made New Year's resolutions. <laughs> and they, they resolved, uh, their resolution was, I'm gonna work out more, I'm gonna lose weight, I'm gonna get in shape. So on January 1st, oh, the gym is so crowded, and January 2nd, and January 3rd, and Jan but by January 5th, yeah, the resolution has just gone away. Why? Because they addressed it on a behavioral level. I'm gonna start behaving differently, thinking that that would change the core. It doesn't. It doesn't. Change that starts outside doesn't make its way to the core. The story is the deepest motivator of the human heart. All right. I want to remind you what the story is. My story is what happened to me and what I tell myself about it. Listen to me say that again. My story is what happened to me and what I tell myself about it. Would you say that with me? My story is what happened to me and what I tell myself about it. Again, my story is what happened to me and what I tell myself about it. Now, I don't want you to memorize that like you memorize God's word, but that is an important component. Because listen to me, please hear me. I can't change what happened to me. I can't. It happened. It's history. I can't change what happened to me, but I can change what? What I tell myself about it, right? It's not what happened to me that causes the lifelong damage. Put your hands up. Get the blood flowing back to your heart and your brain. Just make it come back down here. I, I know you need that because the thing that I'm about to say, you might be angry when I'm done. All right. 
I want you to be able to think this through, all right? And now that we all look like we go to a different church than we do, put your hands back down. I can't change what happened to me, but I can change what I tell myself about it. It's not what happens to me that ruins my life. It's what I tell myself about it that ruins my life because I carry that with me throughout my life. I've done a lot of counseling over the years. I, it so often happened that I would go into a, a tribal setting or a ministry setting and meet with the team that was doing ministry there. And as we got involved in trying to devise strategy, it would, turn, it would come out that, that people, these were just very broken people, uh, terrible things that happened to them in their lives. And we're inclined to think that when, my father died when I was 15 years old, 15 years old, left me with my mother and my grandmother. And now suddenly I'm in charge of the house and fixing things and it just wasn't fair. It wasn't fair. But the fact that my father died when I was 15 is not what ruined my life. It's that it wasn't fair thing that I, car that I carried with me. It was God's plan. And God intended to use that in powerful ways in my life. But because I kept telling myself, it isn't fair, it isn't fair, it isn't fair, it isn't fair. Even God was unable to break through that and do the thing in my life that, that he meant to do. And let me, let me try to give you another illustration of that. I, I had a woman uh, in, in my office. I, I, I keep the window, the shades open in my office when, whenever I'm talking to anybody, not just a woman, but I, uh, and, and she began to tell me this, this broken hearted story. She wept as she told it about how her father had abused her when she was little. And when she went to her mother for protection, her mother said, don't even talk like that about your father. And so she's left alone as this little girl. That led to, to various bad relationships as a teenager. And, and she emerged from her teenage years totally broken. And she would tell you that she's worthless because she's broken, because she's damaged goods, she sat right there in my office, because I'm broken, because I'm damaged goods, I am totally worthless. That was what she was telling herself. This happened to me, and because this happened to me, I am worthless, I am worthless, I am worthless. Can I suggest something to you this morning? Worthless people do worthless things. Worthless people do worthless things. And so I listened to her story and I listened to her say that. And then I related her story back to her and helped her to see, uh, at least on some perspectives, the, see herself the way God sees her. And then there came that moment when I was able to say, I know that you feel worthless. I know that you believe yourself to be worthless. But let me tell you this, let me tell you this. And if you're suffering from something like this in your life, I'm not looking at anybody as I say that, but if you're suffering from something like this in your life, let me say this to you. There was a day, one day, when the God of all the universe had the opportunity to choose anything in the universe to be his very own. And do you know what he chose? He chose you. He chose you. He chose you. He chose you even though he knew that having a relationship with you would cost him the life of his one and only son. The life of the most precious one in the universe was offered in exchange for you. You are not worthless. You are worth more than anything in this universe because of the price that God was willing to pay for you. She sat there and she listened to that. And she wept as I said it. I was weeping too, having been confronted with her story. And I watched that truth just soak into the very corners of her heart. And I wish that you could meet her today. She is a completely different woman, not because I helped her, 
but because she learned to tell herself something different. Worthless people do worthless things. So if I'm worthless, I'm going to do worthless things. But if I'm worth something, if I'm worthy, and I don't know why God decided that I am worthy of the death of Christ, but he did. And so I'm going to take God's opinion on this over my own. It transformed her life completely because it became part of her story. It became part of her story. People change when their story changes. You can't change what happened to them, but we can change what they tell themselves about it. As long as as the story remains intact, the culture and its worldview will remain intact as well. And uh, sister, the, the one who's working with the Ibaloi? Kankana, oh, you're with Kankanae? <laughs> because, yeah, that, see how old I am? As long as the story remains intact, the culture and its worldview will remain intact as well. And so the only way to undo the notions that they have, the culture and the worldview relative to sickness, the only way to undo that is to go after the story. Change the story, change their story, and it will change the way they behave. This is just another, I know we keep saying the same sort of things all the time, but uh, my story taken together with my worldview forms my cultural core. What happened to me, my telling of it, and my interpretation of that changes everything. What happened to me, what I tell myself about it, and my interpretation of that is what drives everything. When things change at the core, it always find its, finds its way outward, and so that means that I have to change, if I, I have to understand the core if I ever, if I expect to understand anything else. You can't understand their behavior. You can't understand why they're doing what they're doing unless you understand the core. And this is true with a people group as well. Let me turn this on. This is true with a people group as well. Hold on a second. There we go. Uh, a people group's worldview is traceable to the story of that people group. The story of a people group is contained in their mythology. Oh, this is the part where, if it would help, I will stand up on this pulpit. Don't make me do that, okay? This is so important. Whenever I go and visit a place where people are working, where people are attempting to provide them with a new story, one of the questions I always ask is, what do you know about the myths of this people group? What do you know about their heritage stories? And I can't tell you how often I've had people say to me, I know nothing. And if you know nothing about their stories, if you know nothing about their heritage stories or their mythologies, uh, their myths, then you really don't understand the group that you're working with. Mythology, uh, and I use that word, I don't like that word. I prefer the, the term heritage stories. But mythology is the word one people group uses to describe what another people group will, will accept as obviously true. They, they, this is why we believe what we believe. This is why we look at the world. You may dismiss it as a myth. Listen. You may dismiss it as a myth, you may dismiss it as being silly, but for him it's real. For him it's real. And once the story has been accepted, there are explanations for every aspect of life. Those explanations form the basis of thought for the people of group, and I, I think I can illustrate this for you. Let's, let's have a little bit of, of fun here. I wanna show you a few pictures I took during one of my trips to Brazil several years ago. Uh, what you're looking at there is a place called Chapada. It's, uh, it, you can see, you can't quite see the way, it, the way it works, but that ledge, that edge over there drops off, <laughs> woohoo, all the way down into that lower part of the, 
the, the valley there. So, you know, already it's a, it's a bit of a frightening place. It's a bit of an unnerving place, this place called Chapada. Uh, it's in the western part of Brazil. Uh, most of the pictures are harmless and common. Uh, uh, the pictures that we took, scenic views and people posing. And, uh, you know, it's just a, it's a, it's a beautiful place. But, but one of the pictures, one of the things that distinguishes this place is the fact that it is, it is the geographical center of South America, exactly in the center. East and west, north and south, it sits there at the center. And so it is a, a place of deep spiritual significance for people who live in Brazil and for people who live in the rest of Latin America. And uh, it's this guy, while we were there, this guy was there praying, and you can see this little thing right there on the day that we visited that spot that is the spot that marks the exact geographical center of south america and if you look closely you can see salt and blood stains do you know why there are salt and blood stains there because they believe that this is the the home the residence of mother earth that's where she is. And so they make offerings to her. Very often they'll come here at night and make offerings to Mother Earth and expect to manipulate the universe by making those offerings. We went there that day and I, I was going through these pictures and looking at them. And then all of a sudden, a picture came up that I didn't recognize. Ooh. I did not take this picture. I, I did not take this picture. There was no red, there was no, I, I did not take this picture. It was just there as the, I found it. And the eyes, especially on my camera, the eyes grow deeper as you stand and look at it and they follow you from place to place. I mean, it's the little hoo 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 hoo. When I saw the picture, I thought, oh my goodness, what is that? I have shown this picture to Americans from my own culture, several Americans from my own culture, and they will always say, always say, there's a scientific explanation for this picture. There is a material explanation for this picture. And then I'll ask, okay, well, what is it? What is the scientific explanation for this picture? And they always say the same thing. <laughs> I, I don't know. <laughs> well, explain it to me. You, give me the sign. I, well, I don't know. But you insist that there's a scientific explanation. Oh, absolutely. I've also shown this same picture to tribal people in its sequence. Chapada, the place where I was, and I got this picture. Can any of you guess what they say about this? Ooh, you have gotten a picture of Mother Earth. I don't know how you did that, but you got a picture of Mother Earth. Americans use a material scientific explanation, even though they can't offer it to me. Tribal people, animists use a spiritual explanation. I, I have a couple of questions for you this morning. <laughs> How many of you here believe that I've somehow captured a spiritual essence here? Maybe Mother Earth. How many of you believe that? Okay. Some of you that are, oh, all right, all right. You, you, you have captured a spiritual essence. How many believe that there's a logical, physical, science-based material explanation for that picture? Okay, there's mostly the same three people, but thank you for, thank you for raising your, your, I don't know what it is. Three is, is like a good number, but I, I don't know why. Mostly the same people. Who, does anybody believe they know what the explanation might be? Uh, it, 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 it was my iPhone. Maybe the spirit of the iPhone was looking at me. Whoa, that's even scarier than Mother Earth. 
iPhone spirit. Woo-hoo-hoo! Okay, um, so none of you are offering an explanation. You're just asking more questions, and, and I appreciate that. But the, the interesting thing is you can't come up with a, a material explanation, but you continue to insist that there is one. And uh, Sherlock Holmes, by the way, is famous for having a Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, but he has Sherlock Holmes say this, when you exhaust and eliminate all other possibilities, whatever remains is the real explanation, no matter how impossible it might seem. That means the most reasonable explanation would be that it's some spiritual essence. But you still don't believe that because you haven't provided a scientific explanation for it. <laughs> and before you sit back and say, I am not coming to tomorrow morning because this man has lost his mind, what I'm trying to illustrate here is that you have a preference for how you interpret that picture. You have a preference. It's the place where you start. Your preference to see it, you, your preference is to see it as material and scientific. Folks from the people group that you work with would not likely agree with you. They're gonna see something completely different in that picture. So worldview forms the basis of thought. Let me see where the Q&A comes up here. Worldview forms the basis uh, and thought for a people group. And um, why don't we, it's just after 10, we, have, we, have, we still have extra time here. Uh, why don't we take, it, do we have a break plan for this morning? I don't wanna send people off. We don't, all right, stand up, take a stretch break, talk with one another about this. If you need to use the comfort room, the CR, then, uh, <laughs> by the way, I've learned over the years that Tagalog is a very easy language to learn. I remember when I was, you know, while we were studying Tagalog, I was up in Manila one day, I pulled into a gas station, you know, where you don't pump your own gas, and I opened the window and I said, pull tank, pull tank, pull tank, pull tank. And the guy looked at me and he said, ah, marunan ka pala mag Tagalog ko. I said, no, because of pull tank? But he was sure that I spoke Tagalog because, oh well, go ahead. If you have a pull tank, go and take care of it. All right. Uh, thank you for settling down. Sometimes it's like herding cats when you try to get a group of people to come back from not hurting cats, herding cats, you know, like uh, trying to herd cows. Um, and, and you, 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 wow, that was great. That was, that was just absolutely great. Um, I'm wondering if you have any questions or comments. Some of you came up to me with questions or came up to me with comments. Um, uh, is there anybody that wants to make those comments public or questions public or do you have other questions? Uh, do, you, do you feel like this is making sense? Or um, questions, comments, thoughts, additions, deletions? Maybe you just want to say, stand up and say, Jay, that is going to leave a stain on my life forever. I don't, I don't know. I, uh, uh, oh, and by the way, I, I could give you what I believe is the, uh, is the, the scientific explanation for that. What's that? How did I get this model? How did I get that photo? I think what happened, um, uh, there was another brother there, a close coworker of mine named Joshua Chang. Uh, uh, Joshua and, and Steve Sang, a few of us uh, w went together several years ago and formed Green Window Ministries, which by the way is a, is a very powerful ministry that's, that's trying to provide an answer for the 1040 window. Um, because there are many churches in the United States who will not support anyone who is not going to work in the 1040 window. And, and that's where the greatest population of unreached people actually are.
But the tribal people of the world, the 2,200 unreached tribal groups, are not in the 1040 window to speak of. They are actually in the green window. And so 23.5 degrees north, 1040 window is 10 degrees north to 40 degrees north, bounded on either side. Uh, Western Europe all the way across, you know, around through Asia is the 1040 window. The green window is 23.5 uh, degrees north to 23.5 degrees south, what we would call the tropics, actually. And uh, tribal people live in deserts, they live in jungles, they're, they're incredibly hard to get to, but we want the church to see them. Tribal people of the world, those 2,200 unreached people groups, are not on the radar of the church in the U.S. right now. And uh, largely, they're not on the radar of, of many churches uh, be, because of the difficulty of getting into them. Joshua Chang was with me there at Shapada, along with uh, a few tribal church leaders. And as we were taking pictures, the picture right before that, and this is what gave it away to me, the picture right before that, uh, that picture came up, uh, uh, rather the picture right after it, was the picture of that group of people that were standing there. Joshua took that picture. He came to me and said, Jay, I wanna take your picture with these people and uh, can I just borrow your, your phone? So I handed him my, I don't have my iPhone with me, but I handed him my iPhone up high like this over a couple of people and he took it and when he grabbed it, I think he pushed the button. My iPhone was upside down at the time and the lens was right there between my fingers. So the sunshine, I think that's the scientific explanation. I never did believe I caught a spiritual essence, but, but as I sort, sorted that out, I thought, you know, I, I didn't believe it was a spiritual essence like my tribal people do, even though I didn't have an explanation for it. And that's what taught me that we, we make that decision by preference, not based on facts. Even when I don't have the facts to support it, my worldview drives a preference. And so I'm gonna say there's a scientific explanation for that because I'm an American, <laughs> not because I can think up the scientific explanation. By the way, you keep that a secret because I wanna use that picture with other groups. <laughs> I, I teach on worldview a lot, you know, as I travel. And so uh, if, you, if you go telling that secret, then they're just gonna say, oh, it was the gifts, the fingers, and it. And if they do that, I'll know it was you, all right? I will come back. I will find you. And I have friends who are headhunters, so don't mess with me. I apologize. Any other questions or comments? All right. Um, we begin by studying the language, and this was something that came out in conversation after that, we, you know, what's the basis, where do we start? We begin by studying the language. As we are studying the language, we use that to study the worldview, to learn their worldview. And at the same time, please, 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 if you're going to teach God's word, don't assume that you know God's word just because you've been to seminary or you've had some training. Study the word on your own. They don't need to hear what your seminary professor taught about Romans. They need to hear what you believe about Romans based on your own spirit-driven study of God's word. I have talked to people in the past who have said, you know, I have time to study or I have time to teach, but I don't have time to do both. And so I choose to teach using this curriculum that's been provided for me. And I always say, please, please. If you have time to teach, but you don't, you don't have time to study, then make time to study so that when you have the opportunity to teach, your teaching will mean something. Your teaching will be based on, on God's word and your understanding of God's word, your spirit-led understanding of God's word, instead of something that you heard your pastor say or a seminary professor say years ago. I, Please forgive me for that. Be a student of God's word. So we study the language, we study the 
the worldview of the people. We learn the worldview of the people. And we learn God's word, led by the Spirit of God. And then the moment comes when we have an opportunity to start teaching. And in one of the other conversations that I had uh, just now, um, let me ask you this question. When does evangelism start? Let's suppose you've moved into a village or an area and you're working on learning the language and you're working on learning the worldview and you're studying God's word. When does evangelism begin? Can anybody answer that question for me? Let, let me preempt that, okay? Most people will say, well, you know, once I've learned the language and I've learned the, 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 the worldview and I've learned God's word and I've taught them historically from God's perspective how the world actually works and, and then I, I finally get to the place where I'm able to start telling them about Jesus, that's when the evangelism begins. And I always say, no, <laughs> no, no, no. The church planting and the evangelism begins the moment you arrive in their village. As they watch you learn the language, they're also watching the way you relate to one another as husband and wife. As they watch you learn the worldview, they're watching the way you treat your children. As, as you're studying God's word, they're watching the way you, you relate to the other people on your team. And here's the deal. By the time you get to death, burial, and resurrection, they already know whether they want to have what it is that you have. They've already made the decision. Either they've watched you live and saw you loving your family and loving one another and, 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 and being joyful, choosing joy in the midst of life. They've watched all of that. And now you're going to stand there and say that it's death, burial, and resurrection that has done this in my life. Then they're going to sit back and say, oh, my goodness, whatever it is that you have, I want it. I want it because of your testimony. But if you've been arguing and bickering, I've been in tribal situations where the team is there together and, and, and this family is sending notes to this family using tribal people to carry the notes back and forth because they are so angry at one another and hate one another so much that they can't be together. And yet they continue to deceive themselves to thinking that when I preach the gospel to these people, they are going to want what I have. That's how they make the decision. And if you don't have something that they're going to want, don't waste your time. Go somewhere else. Or choose to live in keeping with God's word as you relate to one another from the very first day. And then when you get to the gospel, ah, this is the secret. This is what this person, this is what has shaped this person. This is what has driven this person. I want what you have. I want what you have. So I've, I've had people tell me that when I talk about church planting cross-culturally, it doesn't sound easy. And uh, sounds more difficult than I thought it was. And, and I, I always smile and apologize, and, and then I'll say, well, <laughs> maybe now you're really understanding how difficult it is. Do you understand what happens in the heart of cross-cultural church planting? You have been parachuted behind enemy lines. You have been parachuted behind enemy lines, and you know what your job is? To build a fortress for the king, your king, by recruiting enemy soldiers. Stop and think about that. You've been parachuted behind enemy lines and your job is to build a fortress for your king by recruiting enemy soldiers. Can you imagine going to war in our world today like that? Well, we're not gonna send our army over there. We're just gonna take these two, these two ladies right here. We're gonna parachute them behind enemy lines and they're gonna convince everybody to become Filipinos. Oh, it's a bizarre strategy. But it's the strategy that we've been asked to pursue. We're parachuted behind enemy lines and we reach out with love to the people that are living there, that have grown up there, 
and we earn the right to tell them. Because as we quoted earlier, they don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. They don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And when they discover how much you care, then they start wanting to know what it is that you know that so transformed you and your family. I had the privilege several years ago of, of leading a, a Jewish man to Christ. Uh, it was an eight-week conversation that he and I entered in on. And uh, when he got saved, oh my goodness, he got saved. Uh, he, he sat there in his chair and, and I, he said, I just want you to know that I believe that Jesus has died for me, that he was buried and that he rose again on my behalf. And now I want to know what else it is that I need to know. He was truly saved. He wasn't mimicking words. He wouldn't raise his hand, but he was truly saved. And when I asked him years later, what was it that had you listen? Why did you keep coming back to my house to have this conversation as a Jewish man? You know what he told me? He said, I, I saw the way your family loved each other. And I wanted to know what was behind that? The way you related to your children and the way they related to you and the way you and your wife, I, I wanted to know what was behind that. Please understand this. If you go in with the truth and you act like a jerk, I mean, forgive me for the terminology, not looking at anybody as I say that, but if you go in with the truth and you act like a jerk while you're there, please don't expect that, that even the truth will impact them. If they don't see it at work in your life, they're not going to care about it being at work in their life. If they see it changing you, then they're going to want what you have. Where are the onions? Ask yourself that question. Where are the onions? And the story behind that when we first uh, arrived in the Philippines, we went down to Lipa, city of Batangas, and, and, Batangas, and, and we, we studied Tagalog But, but we, you know, we were down there in Lipa, city of Batangas, and, and uh, there in Lipa, there is Fernando Airbes. And uh, Fernando Airbes, uh, Lipa wasn't a very big city, and, and so we went to Fernando Airbes one day, and we asked, you know, could we have a a tour, uh, a bunch of us Americans, and they were happy to show us around and didn't show us anything secret, but they were happy to show us around. And uh, as we were walking along, we found this pelota court. Uh, pelota in Spanish, of course, is just ball. So, you know, this, when I tell this story in Latin America, it doesn't make any sense, but um, there's this pelota course, and we, I, none of us had ever seen a pelota course before. And so we asked the, the the commander that was showing us around, you know, how, how does this game work? And, and he told us how it worked and we got pelota rackets and now, and now we, and then we got permission to go. And, and, and so every day, almost every day, part of the afternoon, we would go to Fernando Air Base and we would play pelota. And connected to the, the pelota court was a cantina. <laughs> and the food in that cantina was terrible. I mean, forgive me for that. It was terrible. But something happened to all of us. We would play a game of pelota, and by the time we were done, we would all say to one another, should we get something at the cantina? Now, we knew the food there wasn't good, but we wanted to get food from the cantina. And we would get food from the cantina, and it wouldn't taste good, but the next day or the day after, we'd be back at that same... And I began to wonder, what? What's... <laughs> How come, how come we keep doing this to ourselves? <clears throat> the man that owned the cantina, he would see these Americans coming in, and, uh, and as soon as he saw us begin our game, he would take some istar margarine, and he would put it on the grill, and he would cut up an onion, very small, and he would put the onion in the butter and saute those onions Are you hungry? Because we, you know, the cantina is right here. We could, <laughs> we did it to ourselves over and over. He didn't lecture us. 
He didn't teach us the truth about hunger. He didn't lecture us about hunger. He didn't try to make us hungry. He just put the onions on the grill. And so I've lived my life asking that question. I want this man to change. I want this man to believe something new. I want this man to trust Christ. I want this man to follow Jesus. My question is at that point, where are the onions? What can I put on the grill to saute so that he'll go, ah, that smells good. That's biblical. We are a savor of life. And that's my question. Are you a savor of life in the place where you're living? When they look at you, do they smell life? Do they want what you have? Christ is our sufficiency and and can bring us to that point. But we have to make up our minds to live according to God's word before we ask anybody else to live according to God's word. So, worldview forms the basis of thought for a people group. That's what we're saying here. It's all about preference. For that reason, we say that worldview is what we think, not what we think about. Worldview is what we think, not what we think about. Worldview drives and shapes all other thoughts. That illustration that I gave, How many of you expect, I could have easily said, how many of you think that it will hit the floor? If you would have raised your hand for that. What I asked was, how many of you believe? Nope, none of us believe that it's going to hit the floor. We think it's going to hit the floor. We expect that it's going to hit the floor because of the way you look at the world, because you understand gravity. I, uh, let me say this, those people in the background there, can, do you recognize that tribal group? Anybody recognize that tribal group? I'll give you a hint. It's in Africa. What's that? Yeah, they're close to the Watusi, but they're not the Watusi. That tribal group is called the Maasai. The Maasai. One of the things that the Maasai do, if you live near Maasai people and you try to have cows, you try to have a herd of cows, do you know what they're going to do? They're going to steal your cows. They are going to steal your cows. That's what they're going to do. Why do they do that? Because they know that when God created, he gave the cows, all of the cows that he created, he gave to the Maasai. And that means that every cow that descended from those first cows belonged to the Maasai. And if you have cows in a ranch near the Maasai, (laughs) they know you took them from them. And so how do we fix that? (laughs) I go and liberate the cows. I'm going to steal your... And there are no end of, 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 of court cases. And, you know, they stole this and they stole that. And the Maasai come away saying, we didn't steal the cows. Yes, but they are in your... Yes, but we didn't steal the cows. He stole the cows. He's the one who, you should put him in jail because he stole the cows that belong to the Maasai. Because it's deep at their core. They don't think about it. They don't wonder, now that man has cows, I wonder if those cows belong, no. Worldview is not what we think about. Worldview is what we think. If you've got cows and I'm Maasai, I think you've got my cows. And I think the only thing that I can do, the only right thing to do at this point, is to come and get them. And that's really amusing. Whenever I tell that story, I see smiles on people's faces and and, a little bit of chuckle going on. And it's funny until you own cows near the Maasai and they take your cows. And then it's it's not funny anymore. Worldview forms the foundation for all other thought. Worldview forms the foundation for all other thought. Now, I I guess I need to know, I asked a little while ago, is this making any sense? Is this, uh, are are you sitting there saying, yeah, I I see the sense of, of studying worldview, of learning worldview before I begin ministry. Does that, is that, I don't want a show of hands, but uh, is it okay if I assume that, that that's resonating 
with you that you can see the rationale behind it. I was, uh, it's so, just so you know, I haven't trapped you. I didn't, I'm not even looking at who, you know, nodded their heads. But uh, I was lecturing a while back to a group of missionaries from a certain organization, and the organization will remain nameless at this point. I, I've done this a lot over the years, having these conversations. And I began to play what we call in the United States devil's advocate with them. I asked them to imagine that I was a new missionary on their field. Right? I, I've just arrived here. I'm brand new. I've been through the training and, and now I'm here. And, and, and then I, I tell you as, as a new missionary sitting there in the guest house, I tell you that I've decided not to do culture study because so much teaching curriculum had been developed for other people groups and I was just planning on using that, that thing that I described earlier. I know that my brother over there did develop teaching curriculum and, and, and a storying approach for that people group. I'm just gonna use that, that story and curriculum. I, you know, I'm, and so because that's already there, I don't have to do worldview study at all. And, and so I asked them, I said, let's just imagine that that's the case. And it was a group about this size. Let's just imagine that that's the case. I'm the new missionary. I just said I'm not going to do worldview study. I'm not going to do culture study because uh, curriculum has already been developed. What would you say to that? And oh, my goodness, <laughs> did they take me to task? I mean, they, you know, they, well, you know, I was friend of They had all kinds of reasons for doing worldview study. They agreed with me wholeheartedly. And, uh, and so I backtracked and I said to them, oh man, uh, light of my life, you have convinced me. And then I added that you are so convincing that you must have some very impressive culture files on the people group where you're working. You must have done a worldview study and written it up. And then I said, can I see them? <laughs> Busted, you know, that everybody sat there and suddenly, it, it, you know, it just kind of all went like a balloon losing air. They just, they just absolutely deflated. And I didn't mean to embarrass them. I, I just meant to illustrate for them that there's a difference between believing something needs to be done and actually doing it. There's a difference between agreeing that a particular thing needs to be done and actually forming a strategy that helps you to get it done. So if, if there is any chance that God has prompted your hearts in some way, I think it would be a really good idea for you to begin to get in underneath. It's not too late for you to be get, begin to get in underneath uh, the worldview because you're going to run into things as you study and suddenly the light will come on in your thinking. Oh, that's why they won't get baptized. Oh, because that's why they won't get baptized. It's not about a language problem. It's not because I haven't taught it powerfully. They won't get baptized because of this thing in their worldview that's telling them not to be baptized. That's why they won't trust God to help them to get well. Because there's something in their worldview that's blocking that but it's not gonna show itself to you unless you, go, unless you go and look for it. I'm afraid that we pay lip service to culture study, to worldview study, and the need for an in-depth worldview analysis, but our actions belie our words. It, it doesn't do any good to say, I agree with this, it's an important thing to do, and then walk away and not do it. I, I don't want to put you on a guilt trip, but, but please, if the Spirit of God is prompting you, I, I'd be glad to help you discover the way of, of uncovering worldview. I'd be glad to take that time with you if it would all help. When I say that I have to do a worldview study, I should mean that I understand that my ability to have an eternal impact on these people will be severely compromised unless, unless I, number one, come to a deep understanding of their present world view. 
I have to understand the way they look at the world. Number two, articulate how that worldview differs from the eternal worldview expressed in God's word. You see what we're saying? You're studying their worldview, but you've also studied God's word, and now you're able to explain the differences between the two. Number three, devise a plan for helping them to cherish and preserve the parts of their worldview that are remnants of the time when they knew God. By the way, did you know that? Every people group on the earth at one time knew God. Jay, what are you saying? <laughs> Do, is, is that true? Every people group on the earth at one time knew God. How do we know that? Romans chapter 1. For when they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, neither were they thankful, but they exchanged temporary physical things for the eternal God. They put other things in his place. And according to Romans 1, because they did not want, they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them up and let them go because they refused to retain him in their knowledge. They knew God and there will be, listen, listen, there will be remnants of their culture and worldview that have come from the days when they first knew God. Years and years and years ago, just after creation, prior to the, the Tower of Babel. And then number four, de devise a plan that helps them to discard those parts of their worldview that are in direct conflict with their appreciation and assimilation of God's own worldview. There are going to be things that keep them from really believing what God has to say. So I do the study, and as I do the study, I try to understand their worldview, and then I articulate, I, I explain, and for me, it's writing a worldview paper. This is how these people look at the world, and this is how it's different from the way God looks at the world. And then I want to help them to devise a plan to keep the things, listen, encourage them to keep their language. Encourage them to teach their language to their children. Don't let a language get lost because they're being assimilated into the Tagalog culture. It's important that they know the language of the nation, the national language, but it's also important, equally important, that they keep their own language. And then there are gonna be things from their worldview that are gonna be discarded, need to be discarded. Can anybody help me with this? Uh, you know a little bit about the Bukalot, right? Can you think of a part of their worldview that would need to be discarded? No? Nothing? Okay. They were headhunters. <laughs> Do you think it's important for them to discard that as they begin to follow Jesus? Oh, yeah, it's important for them to discard that as they begin to follow Jesus. If there's other things going on in the culture, and, and I know what some of you are thinking. Um, <laughs> oh, boy. Did he just say out loud that some parts of the culture will have to change? that some things will have to be discarded. And now you're maybe thinking, that's it. I'm not listening to him anymore because he's talking about changing the culture and, and we get accused of that all the time. And we missionaries, we don't change the culture. We, we you know, we, uh, um, you'll, uh, and, and so you may say to yourself that I'm not listening to him anymore. Um, you may find numerous reasons to stop listening to me, but this isn't one of them. I said out loud that some of the parts of the culture will have to be discarded, but I said that because I believe that that is the inevitable and escapable, inescapable outcome of tampering with the worldview. Your message will provide them with a new story. And when they have a new story, you have tampered with their worldview. And change will happen as a result of that. Jesus did the same thing. Listen, he came into our world and he changed things forever and made no apology about it. 
He changed the way we look at the world forever. No culture is static. Every culture is in a constant state of flux and change. The culture will change over time because of outside influence, but it will also change over time without outside influence. Your presence there simply accelerates that change. They'll begin to change very quickly when you teach them God's word. And people may accuse you of changing the culture, but in reality, that is just a gross oversimplification of what actually happened because you went there with the truth. Someone wise has said that the two most basic building blocks of culture are religion and morality, belief and values. The two most basic building blocks of the culture are religion and morality. And then he said, if you change either one of these over a broad spectrum, you have changed the culture. Listen to that. Uh, religion and morality are the two most basic building blocks of the culture. And if you change either one of these across a cultural spectrum, you've changed the culture. It is inevitable. Any guesses as to who said that? I already said he, so you know it was a man. I, I'll, I'll tell you this. It wasn't a missionary. It wasn't an anthropologist. It's going to be somebody that's very impressive when I show this next picture to Americans. It may be less impressive for you, but the person who said that, anybody know who that is? That is George Washington, the father of our country. The father of our country. George Washington said, if you change morality or religion across the broad spectrum of a culture, you will change that culture. Let me ask you something. Do you intend to teach things that will change the morality or the religion of the people that you're working with? Some of you are not sure. Let's, let's all go like this, okay? Because if you're not going to go in and teach things that will change their religion and their morality, stay home. Don't, you know, don't, don't, don't do that. Religion and morality are always the two most ex significant expressions of a culture's worldview. What I believe to be true and what I believe to be proper or right give direction to my thoughts. What I believe to be true and what I believe to be proper. If what I believe to be true or what I believe to be proper or right changes, my thoughts, attitudes, actions will change as well. And that happens in, to individuals, and that individual change happens across the culture. The change cannot be avoided. Should I stop here for Q&A? Have you ever been accused of changing the culture of the people that you're working with? Well, maybe this isn't something that's, that, that has come up. But uh, in Brazil, where you know where we're working with uh, with tribal people, I, I, I continue to to maintain my connection with uh, with Alteco and with uh, Comple, which is a large tribal organization there in in Brazil. When when we go down there, uh, this is one of the questions that that we ask. This is one of the questions that we talk about. The Funai is the government agency that oversees tribal people. And the Funai has forbidden, listen to me, they have forbidden you and I from going into the Shingu Valley and the Jevari Valley, where there are several tribal groups. You cannot go there because you're Filipino, because you're a missionary, because I'm American, because I'm a missionary. I can't go there. If you're going in there to change the culture, you can't go. If you're going in as a missionary, you can't go. Tourists can go. Oh, tourists can go. <laughs> as though they're not going to change the culture by their very presence. But tourists can go. You know the, the redeeming quality there, the redeeming factor there? And it's just not going to sound redeeming. But I, I actually I have a video on my computer of a Brazilian member of parliament who's standing up 
giving an address to the rest of parliament. And he actually says in Portuguese, I don't care what you say, these tribal people are not human. These tribal people are not human and therefore they do not deserve human rights. You have to be human to qualify for human rights. That's the way he phrases it. But the redeeming quality of that is that the government, because they don't offer human rights to the tribal people, they also tell the tribal people, they also believe that they can't tell the tribal people what to do. Uh. So they can keep you and me out of reaching the Jevari Valley or the Shingu Valley, but they can't stop the tribal believers from going into those places. God has found a workaround to get the gospel to those tribal people. And so I think it falls to us to help the tribal people how to know how to be more effective as they minister cross-culturally. All right, any other questions or answers? Uh, Jay, please be careful while you talk because you're talking too strongly or any other, any comments, questions, additions, deletions? Religious colonialists. Okay, hey, he's saying that, that uh, if you know where he works, then you know who he's talking about. Um, are religious colonialists, what, what do you think they mean by that? Yes. So he's saying from history, Muslims tend to believe that, that they that uh, the Spanish came here uh, 400 years ago. They were here 400 years ago. They created a Spanish colony, and that's really kind of what's left over here, that they are religious colonialists. I like that. So is it from history, or is there more of a driver in that evaluation that they're making? What does Islam do? It goes in and Indonesia, for example. They are religious colonialists is what they've done. They take their religion and colonize the people with that religion. And so it's driven by history and what they've seen, but it's also driven by the way they look at the world, their worldview. And so when they see us moving in, they assume that we are just gonna colonize those people. And forgive me for saying this, but I, I've been with missionaries about whom that's true. Uh, they go in there and they expect to be in charge for the rest of their lives there in that place. And they create a little Jesus colony there and never empower the people to lead within their own church. And so, I, I don't know, sometimes it, it does become a reality, even though it's being observed by people that believe things, different things from us. Other other questions or comments? Yes. Oh, that 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 is such a perfect setup question. What is the best way to learn the worldview? She's asking, and uh, that's really where I I want to take you. We want to talk about guilt cultures, shame cultures, and fear cultures, and 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 dig down into that a little deeper. Uh, because the first step is trying to discover which you're looking at and uh, the, way that you, the way that you learn a culture, the way that you learn a worldview is by starting on the outside of the diagram. You watch their behavior. You take note of their behavior. You observe when you're sitting in a place. You observe how they, want, how they deal with a crying child. You observe how they deal with the husband-wife relationship, how they do all of that and then you trace that back through by asking questions to get to the center of it, just like we did with walking through the garden. Okay. Now, they, they don't understand uh, the, 
what if they can't answer your question because they don't understand what you're doing, um, what they're doing? My, my advice would be to stop asking the question, why? Don't ever ask the question, why? Because they, it, it is important to know why they think it is. And sometimes people will have some idea why it's going on. But, but stick to what, how, when, where. Uh, like the, the people who woke up with the crying baby and started hollering and shouting. The question that I asked ultimately was, what would happen if you didn't? And when he explained what would happen, I instantly knew why they were doing that. If I had asked, when I asked him, why do you shout and holler when the baby wakes up? Do you remember what I, and then when I told this story, what he said to me? Why do you shout and holler? His answer was, because the baby woke up. <laughs> okay, that doesn't help me. It helps him, but it doesn't help me. And in order to get to that, I have to change my question. I can't ask, why do you shout and holler when the baby wakes up? I can ask, what would happen if you didn't? And when he says, oh, the spirit, the evil spirit would come and, and eat the soul of the baby. Wow. Now I've gotten into the belief system and, and closer into the worldview as well. Yes. Uh, I just would like to share. Maybe this would help Joyce uh, to answer some of her questions. Uh, some years back, we mentored 37 missionary workers inside Indonesia. For three years, we have been helping them. And in, uh, on the last year we were there, uh, some years back, about 50,000 years ago for me. 50,000 years ago? <laughs> oh, dear. I still have hair. Oh, wow. <laughs> God has blessed you with that. <laughs> One of them shared, he said, uh, the Lord led me to a kampung, to a village. Kampung, okay. And uh, he approached the village leader and said, we are, Christi we are Christians, we are a couple. We are Christians, but we would like to live inside your kampung. We want to study your culture, your religion, Islam. Uh, we are curious. You know, the village leaders decided, why not? Come. We would like you to know about Islam. Hmm. So they just prayed and started have, uh, to befriend all of the... It's a small village. Then that leader died. He has 10 kids. So he asked the Lord, Lord, what should we do? The Lord led them and impressed upon their hearts, you adopt the youngest one because they have 10 kids and they are poor. So he went to the mother, grieving mother, and said, uh, we would like to help. We would like to adopt we will feed your youngest child. We will educate him to, to the school. To, uh, we will pay for the school bills. But she's still your child. Anytime you can go to our house and we can bring him to your house. Is that okay? Yes. Hmm. Long story short, today they have, he said he was uh, sharing, today they have three adopted children. Three years old, seven years old, 10 years old. And the village leaders are saying, why are you doing this? That's the best question he got. Mm -hmm. And he said, because we love you and because of Isa Almasi. Mm -hmm. He said, I don't have a convert yet, but I feel soon it will come. Excellent. You journey with them. Journey That's with his them. platform. You be with them and listen to what they have to say and cry with them. And I think that's what is important. I, I think that's, that's a good answer. You, you, you journey with them. You live with them. You stay there in the village with them. You, you become part of their lives. You invite them to become part 
of your life and when they're able to see the love that's in your heart and how much you care and how much and how much and how much, that's when you're able to have the greatest impact. That's when. I don't know if that answers your question. There, uh, I know you probably feel like they've given me way too much time to talk about worldview. Uh, I wish that we had more time because uh, uh, one of the seminars that I teach is actually a workshop where we look at worldview issues and then we actually plan curriculum that will speak to the worldview where you're working. And you sit there and you plan your own curriculum in a guided conversation around with other people. And uh, uh, we're going to talk in a little while about barriers, bridges, and blanks uh, w within the worldview and, and what you're looking for as you study, as you study. So, yeah, just, just become part of them. Just because you speak their language doesn't mean you understand them. It, it doesn't mean that you understand them. And, you know, in response to redeeming the language by choosing this particular word to translate it, uh, we're treating that issue that you raised as though, as though it's a language problem. It's not a language problem. It's a worldview problem. And so when you attempt to redeem the language and you do it at the risk of being able to redeem people, I think that's a very bold and unnerving move because God didn't so love the languages of the world that he gave his one and only son. He so loved the people of the world that he gave his one and only son. And so our efforts at redemption should not be focused at the language and redeeming specific words within the language. Our, our, our focus should be using language and an understanding of their worldview to impress God's worldview on them. And then they will choose which word they're going to use. They will know as they go which one will work best for them. It shouldn't be people outside of the culture, outside of the worldview, that are making that decision, in, in my opinion. Uh, I, I know I'm walking... <laughs> I'm walking through a minefield when I say that because, you know, that's an issue that will explode very quickly. It has exploded in other places where I've, I've done these lectures. But any other questions or comments? Oh, yes. Yes, absolutely. Yes, by all means. He's asking if he can respond to the question earlier. Just would like to share this one because uh, we Are also have our mask. Just would like to respond to the question that Kavita uh, shared a while ago. Uh, in our team, we believe that you cannot separate the language and the culture. Mm -hmm. So as we entered into the community, uh, we we learn the cult we learn the language, and to do that one, we identify. In my case, I identified two persons to help me learn the language. And when I established the relationship with the person, I would like the person to tell me the stories of the community. And once the person starts to share the stories, I will be able to know the worldview. Hmm. Uh, then in our team, we gather all the cultural observations that we have. And then we do community hermeneutics. Together with the team, we interpret the cultural obs observations that we gathered, mm -hmm. and then uh, we we try to make it sure that uh, we can find redemptive analogies, okay. bridges to use in order to communicate the gospel. Uh, it's not uh, the stories, the cultural observations that we have. We compare it to another ministry areas, so that. Uh, we will be able to ensure that this is really, you know, worldview for not only in this one one place, but also in another place. In the case that this worldview is not the worldview in another ministry area, then we will be able, we, we, 
we think of more redeem, redemptive analogy that we can connect the gospel okay. as we tell the story. So okay. that's the thing that we are working with. I like that. I like that. Um, uh, I use this same model with the world, with the story and the worldview at the center when I'm sitting and doing counseling and I, I do a fair bit of counseling. It's not something that I've ever sought after, but it's something that I end up doing. It, it, it feels like, um, when someone comes to me that has, they have this problem. I am angry all the time. I'm just, and I've actually had people sit with me and say, anger is the only emotion I feel. There's no joy, there's no peace, there's no comfort, there's no excitement, there's no enthusiasm. Anger is all that's left. I am angry all the time. And occasionally I erupt like that and go after my children or I kick the dog or, you know, I argue with my wife and I make them feel small and I am tired of it. And, you know, I'm thinking they're probably tired of it too. And so I want to stop. Well, I can look at them and say, hey, stop being angry all the time. Stop erupting like that. Stop being so. If I do that, then they're going to, if I show them Bible verses that say, don't be angry, then they're going to look at me and say, Jay, that's why I'm here talking to you. Because I don't know how to obey those Bible verses. I try, but I can't make it happen. Well, I know the behavior that's distressing them. And I know the behavior that's distressing their family. And if I go after the behavior, I'm not going to be able to help at all. So can you guess with me what it is that I do at that moment? I ask them to tell me their story. Talk to me about being a little boy. Talk to me about school. Talk to me about your relationship with teachers. Talk to me about your relationship with your parents. Talk to Dr. And, and it's, it's wonderful to watch because people get into telling their story. And it, I've, I've sat with people for 10 or 12 hours, not straight, but 10 or 12 hours as they tell me bits and pieces of their story. And what I'm looking for is patterns. I'm looking for patterns. When has this come up before? When I'm counseling, I use four principles. And I use them in order. I... I explore, I evaluate, I explain, and I exhort. I explore, I evaluate, I explain, and I exhort. Exploring has to do with me hearing your story. It's in the spirit of, of me saying to you, I can't tell you how to get where you want to go unless I know where you are right now. And that's what I tell them. As you tell me the story, I'm looking for you. I want to get to know you. And so we explore and we explore and I hear the story and I look for patterns. And then when we're done exploring, sooner or later they actually say, yesterday this happened and today I'm here talking to you again. And that's when I feel like it's time for me to evaluate. And I'll, I'll often say to them, you know, I need some time to pray through this, to pray through your story. And when I evaluate, do you know what I'm doing? I'm taking, I'm comparing the way they look at the world now to the way God looks at the world. Because I believe that stress is measured, emotional stress is measured by the distance between the way I look at the world and the way God looks at the world. I want to know that distance. And so I evaluate and I articulate that for myself. And thirdly, I sit down with them and I say, you know, when I look at you, I, I know that you're a full grown woman, but I see that little girl who, who put on her mommy's shoes and a pretty dress and came out and, and just spun around in front of her daddy because she wanted to hear him say, oh, you make that dress look beautiful. You are so beautiful to me. You, you matter to me. I cherish you. She needed to hear that from her father. But as she spun around and said, Daddy, Daddy, look at me, he sat there at his desk 
and he was intent on the book that he was reading or the newspaper or the news show that he was watching, and he said to her, you get out of the way. Just get out of the way. I see your dad doing that to you. And I believe that that has happened over and over and over again to you till today you've reached an opinion about yourself that simply is not true. Because you're not looking at yourself the way God looked at you. And one of two things happens at that point. I actually paint a whole picture of all the patterns that I've seen. One or two things happen at that point. Either they will say, Jay, you have no idea who I am. Or they will often say, Jay, nobody has ever described me that completely, but that's me. And then I use that opportunity. Once I've explained and we've agreed, then I say, can I show you some things from God's word that will impact what you're seeing in your life now? Can I tell you who God thinks you are? Can I tell you what God has said about you? God, who sees all things as they truly are, has said this about you. God's not making stuff up. And that's where transformation comes. Because the transformation, the, the, the difficulties began on the story level when, when he was a little boy. The transformation is going to begin on the story level as he gets told the things that he wasn't told while he was growing up. When I, when I teach parenting, my wife and I teach parenting seminars, and when I teach parenting, that's one of the things that I ask is, Dad, Dad, you be the one to put the kids to bed. Let mom get them in their jammies and everything, but when it's time for them to settle down, you be the one to put the kids to bed. And in the spirit of the idea that my story is what happened to me, and, and what, I told myself, what I tell myself about it, I, I want to know from my kids. And we did, I did this. Every, I wasn't always home, but every night that I was home, I put all three of our kids to bed. The youngest one first, and then the middle one, and then the oldest one, and I'd sit on their bed. And you know the secret of this? They don't want to go to sleep. I've had parents say this to me, I can't get my kids to talk to me. Put them to bed. Because they don't want to go to sleep right now. Even if you're sitting there scratching their back, they don't want to go to sleep. And if you're going to ask them questions, they'll, they'll answer those questions for just so they don't have to go to sleep. <laughs> and the two questions that I ask, the two things that I try to sort out is what happened to you today? Well, well, I was in a classroom and I did my homework last night, but the teacher said, was it who who was the president that said this and i said abraham lincoln because i thought it was abraham lincoln but it wasn't abraham lincoln it was george washington and so the teacher said to me well somebody didn't do his homework but i did my homework i just got the answer wrong oh buddy that's, that's kind of, so you know what I want to know now? What did you tell yourself? Because you came home with a smile on your face. What did you tell yourself to get over that? Well, I just said to myself that my teacher is a poopy head. It's not going to be profound at the end of any given day. My teacher is a poopy head. And uh, I usually use that moment to say, well... Yeah, but in the back of my mind, I'm comparing that attitude. What if he grows up with the attitude that teachers are poopy heads? Policemen are going to be poopy heads, too. As will the CEO and boss in his company where he works. They'll be poopy heads, too. Because they're going to say things to him that, well, it's just not right. They've missed the point with him. If he grows up, that is not a successful way to go through life. So I want to take what, how, how does God see teachers? Oh, yeah, they made a mistake. She made a mistake today, but she's pouring into your life and she cares about you and she wants you to learn and to succeed. And don't, don't be dismissive of her just because of this one mistake that she made today. My conviction is 
that if you do that at the end of every single day, that your child is far more likely to grow up with God's worldview than if you just let him make up things on his own. Find out what happened to them. Find out what they told themselves about it. And I did that with each of our kids every night until the night before their wedding, believe it or not. Couldn't do it while they were away at college, but they came home in order to get married. And the night before their wedding, I sat on the bed with them and I said, I, I won't ever do this again. I won't ever have this chance again. Let's just talk. Before you go to sleep, let's just talk. And what works with a child works with a culture. You hear their story, their collective stories. You look for patterns. You explore. You evaluate. You compare what they see of the world with what God sees of the world. You evaluate. And then you have the opportunity to begin to explain it to them. And how do you do that? You do that by starting back in the beginning and helping them to see where their story went wrong. Not by attacking their story, but by telling them the truth. Because the truth is more powerful than the lie, always. And with the backing of the Spirit of God to convincing them of the truth. And then finally, the moment comes when you can exhort them to do what? Believe in Jesus, who gave his life for you, who was buried and who rose again. And then it's up to them what they do with it. A culture is nothing more than a collective personality. That's all it is. That's all it is. This model that I put up there for you has completely transformed my life and my ministry. I want you to know that in the spirit of knowing your audience. Any other comments? We have, we have six minutes. Uh, let me do, uh, well, let me just uh, do a little more. And tomorrow morning, I'll start with the Bukalot story because these notes end at the Bukalot story, and I can't do that in six minutes. But uh, let me just say this in, in closing for this morning. When you change a culture's religion or the culture's morality, you have changed the culture. That, that's why you went there. Change, <coughs> change isn't your goal. You didn't go in there to change the culture, but it is an anticipated outcome. So as, an, as we enter a people group, we can pretend that the culture won't change. Don't do that. You can do that, but please don't. Or we can accept that it will change and put a plan in place to, appro to, to appropriately minimize the random damage our presence will create. Your presence there will create random damage because you're not from there. And so the ideas that you bring in have the potential not only of helping them, but of damaging them. And I think it's better to do that with a plan. The change should be planned. You should be able to articulate it before you begin. The truth of the matter is, I'm going to be an agent of change, and there's nothing that I can do to prevent that. That's why you went. You went there to be an agent of change. And so you don't want you, you don't want anyone else to prevent that. So as, as we enter a people group, um, I'd rather be an educated, thoughtful, and careful agent of change within the culture than an uneducated, random, and irresponsible agent of change. I don't want them to become Americans. I don't want you to become Americans. We're a mess over there. I don't want you to become Americans. I don't want you to do uh, ministry the way Americans do ministry. That's not why I'm here. I'm calling you back to the way Jesus did ministry. He became incarnate in our world. He understood us deeply. He, it actually says of him that he knew what was in the heart of a person. He knew. And those were the issues that he spoke to. He knew your heart, and he spoke to your heart from his heart. I would rather have a reasonable idea. That's a long one. 
By the way, if you have a cell phone, you can take pictures of these and, and uh, you're free to use it. But I'd, I'd rather have a reasonable idea where the changes will take them based on where they are now and how to help them to get there than operate on the fly and be undone by changes that I didn't anticipate that take them places where no culture should go. I don't want to operate on the minister now, pay later plan. I don't want to do that. I want to pay ahead. I want to do my homework. I want to make sure that I know. And if there's, if, if you're working in, among one of the major religions in this world today, it's likely that by the time you get to the gospel, the people who are in charge of that religion in that place will go after you. They will do everything that they can to stop you. And you can actually build it into your teaching to anticipate that moment. But you've got to know to do that. You have to anticipate that it's going to come. It's inevitably true that some things within a culture will have to be discarded. And I know that, that those are fighting words for some of you. But uh, um, And since I have two minutes, I'll just tell you this part of the story. I was traveling with a lady some years ago, and uh, I wasn't traveling with her, actually. She happened to be sitting next to me in the plane. Uh, we were both frequent flyers, and back in those days, they used to leave the middle seat. They'd put two frequent flyers on either side of a middle seat, uh, you know, if you were gold or diamond or 1K or whatever, and the middle seat would be empty. And so I'm sitting next to this lady who, uh, oh, she's just dressed, I mean, jewelry and oh my goodness and uh, they they she uh they served us a meal uh, pretty quick at the beginning of the flight and, and now we're sitting there pretending to eat with the pretend utensils and the pretend dishes and and the pretend food on the airline and uh, she she turned to me and, and she told me her name i i don't ever harass a woman but she turned to me and she told me her name and so i told her my name and uh and and she said to me uh the next question was Anybody know? What do you do? What do you do? She wants to know what I do. She, she figured out already that I fly a lot. What do you do? Now, normally, I'm hoping to share the gospel with the person that I'm sitting next to, so I don't say that I'm a missionary. I don't say that I'm a pastor, because they're going to think that I'm telling them the gospel because it's my job to tell people the gospel. I don't want them to think that. I want them to think that I'm telling them the gospel because I believe it at my very core, and it's an important message to me. And so what I usually say is, oh, I'm in communications, <laughs> which is what I am. I'm, in com I'm always trying to communicate something. I'm in communications. And usually that's vague enough that they don't say, what kind of, I'm in communications. But in this particular occasion, I said, well, I, I'm, a, I'm a missionary, and I work with tribal people. And I don't know why I said that, but it just, it fell right out of my mouth. I'm a missionary and I work with tribal people. And she did that thing that you ladies are so good at. And, and I'm not very good at it, so I may ask for your help. She went. Help me out, ladies. I, I'm not very good. My wife is great at that. And as soon as she makes that noise, I know she thinks I've done something stupid, right? She said to me, she went, and then she said, you know, I think, I hope you don't mind my saying this, she said. I hope you don't mind my saying this, but I think you ought to leave those people alone because they're happier the way they are. I wanted to say, I hope you don't mind my saying this, but that is the stupidest thing I have ever heard. I, I wanted to say that. I did not say that. I don't know if there's extra credit in heaven, but I hope that there's extra credit because I, I didn't say that. What I said instead was, uh, ma'am, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm just going to guess, uh, based on looking at you, that you've probably never visited a tribal village that you've probably never been with tribal people. It was based on that statement that you made. I said, would that be true? And she said, well, yes, of course. I've never visited a tribal village or been with tribal people. I said, okay, I, I don't mean to make you angry, 
I, I just mean to say that, that I have. I've lived with tribal people. I've visited and helped in, in more than 100 different tribal groups, people groups around this world. And I would like to tell you a story, a story about something that we experienced as a family. And then maybe you'll be able to reflect for me on whether those people were happier before we arrived than they are now. And tomorrow, I will tell you that story. So, you know what, maybe you'll want to be here again tomorrow. I apologize that I'm doing all the talking up here. I'm, I'm glad for the Q&A and the forum. I've been able to learn some things from some of you, and, and I appreciate, I really, truly do. Uh, my knowledge has come from the mistakes that I've made over the years and the learning that I've done in the process. But uh, tomorrow morning, I will briefly tell you the Bukalot story. I know that some of you have heard it, but um, I'll tell you the Bukalot story. And then you can decide whether or not they're happier now or happier when in those days before the gospel came. God bless you. Thank you. Are there any announcements to conclude this morning? Oh, somebody is running up here with a paper. I'm going to guess there's announcements. <laughs>